I mean, last summer, I think we were all dealing with stuff. And I don't think many of us knew how to deal with it. I think a thing for me is I am a black gay female, right? And I think a lot of times in both communities, we try to separate them. It's like, you can't be both. And so for me, I just needed to like put that out there. Like, yes, I'm hurt that George Floyd was murdered. I'm hurt that all of my black brothers and sisters are being murdered. But also like recognize that we can still celebrate Pride Month and also understand that there's trauma within the black LGBTQ community. Whether Welcome to Beyond the Ball Podcast. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on, ballers? And welcome to another episode of the Beyond the Ball podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones. And as you all know that we find uh, different individuals all across the country who are doing amazing and phenomenal things, ultimately going back to the mission and the premise of our show, which is to help student athletes succeed beyond their degree. And we do that by focusing on stories, strategies, and successes. And if you have not taken the time to subscribe to our YouTube channel, I would encourage you to do so. Just type in Jonathan Jones Speaks and you'll see the, the podcast and you'll see some other exclusive content. So let's stay connected there. But now without further ado, I'm excited to bring out today's guest. Um, just seeing a lot of the work that she's done just all across the country. And uh, she's not only a speaker, but she's an educator as well as a consultant. I'm excited to welcome to Beyond the Ball today. Welcome out, Risa Lovelace. Risa, how are you doing? I am doing great. The sun is shining. I can't really complain. <laughs> good deal. Good deal. The, the, the sun is shining and, you know, we're, we're not in a pandemic. We are in a pandemic. Who knows, right? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Wear your mask get vaccinated, you know, do what feels best for you. Um, you know, make sure that you're staying safe for yourself and your loved ones and, and the folks that are around you. That's all we can ask of anybody. Most definitely. Most, most definitely. So Risa, I'm, I'm going to kick it back to you now and give you a chance just to, you know, do an introduction of yourself for the people who, who might not have been able to grace your presence as of yet. So please feel free at this time. All right. Uh, like Jonathan said, my name is Risa Lovelace. Um, I am the founder of RBL Theory, which is a identity-based inclusion consultant agency. I'm also currently serving as the assistant athletic director for student athlete development at the University of Maryland in College Park. Um, I have over 11 years, close to 12 years now of experience in higher education and college athletics. Um, starting off at George Mason University, I headed out west um, to the University of Oregon, and it has been great to be able to come back home uh, to the University of Maryland, which you know I grew up five minutes away from this institution. Um, but even prior to my work experience, um, I was a collegiate bowler at Hampton University, which is a historical black college. Not many people know that. Most folks guess yeah. I was on track team or play basketball. But nope, bowling was the sport. Um, and I received my master's from Old Dominion University. So spent a lot of time uh, in the 757 for those who don't know, uh, Hampton, uh, Norfolk area of Virginia. Wow. Hold on. Wait, we can't, we can't blow past the bowling. <laughs> we, 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 got, we got to take a little bit of time there. What, so how, how, did you, when, when, how did you get exposed to bowling and then... You know, for you to even you, you had to be cold if you were a collegiate <laughs> bowler. Talk about it. Talk about so, it. So it's interesting because I felt like most black families bowling is the thing that we do. Right. Like that's just what you would do on a weekend. You go out and you bowl. Um, and so I started as a kid and I, I still believe that my first love was to play basketball. But um, from about six to high school, bowling is what I did every Saturday. I mean, we were winning championships. They kicked us out of one house at one point because we were winning all of the awards. And so we had to go find another bowling house to um, to compete in. And so, yeah, it, it got dicey when we were young because folks didn't like us winning that much. But honestly, I walked on at Hampton University. I had planned on going to college to just be a, a normal student. Not, I didn't want the weight of, um, you know, having somebody dictate what my schedule was. But 
when you enter Hampton University, they give you a big brother or a big sister. And I was fortunate to have two big sisters who I'm still in connection with today who wanted to know, well, what, what do you do? And so they were like, well, we have a bowling team. I don't think that they realized that it was a collegiate bowling team. I thought it, I thought they just thought it was for fun. And so <laughs> I walked on to the team and eventually became a scholarship student athlete, right? So I, it's funny now doing the work that I do and being able to understand my walk-on student athletes, but also understanding my full scholarship student athletes and bridging the gap for those who get, get that chance of growth. Mm. So talk a little bit about the, like the, Big brother and big sister. Well, for you having having two big sisters, but talk talk a little bit about like that approach and how that molded you just earlier in your in your collegiate years. Yeah. So literally the first day you walk on campus, they take all of the first years to the football um, stadium. All of the they're called student leaders at that point. They line up and they start yelling people's names and you go down and you meet them. And throughout your first year, they literally kind of help you walk through um, your first year, which I think is great. I mean, obviously, Hampton is a much smaller school, less than 5,000 students. And so it really helps us kind of build that community when you don't really know what you're walking into. I feel like I was probably one of the few folks that didn't know anybody that was going to the institution, kind of just winging it, at, mm. so to speak. Um, but they really helped kind of guide me through that first year, which I think is helpful, especially when you have students who are coming from out of state and don't know anybody to actually have somebody, even though in the beginning it feels forced, but eventually it, it becomes the family. And I think that's what, to me, makes a difference between an HBCU and a, a PWI. Okay. Okay. Well, now I, I, I should have another question about the bowler. Have you have you bowled a have you bowled a perfect game or bowled a? I have before? not bowled a perfect game because my nerves will not allow that. I, my highest score is two seventy nine, which is one strike away from three hundred. Wow. Wow. Okay. That's that's so that's so cool because I grew up. <laughs> you know, I, I grew up and then uh, what? Every once in a while, we'd go like Friday nights, go bowling with my dad. See? And, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was it was a it, it was one of the things that I know was a different experience. Well, looking back now, I can say I know that's a different experience. Yep. Just like you know, some other things that we might not feel. I'm saying we just like some other things that other people might not feel privileged to. I know I wanted rollerblades because I saw other people <laughs> with rollerblades, yep. but this is an experience that everybody has mm -hmm. per se. And so. and the funny part is, my parents met in a bowling alley. Hmm. <laughs> so it is like a family thing. It was love at first strike. Love at first strike. Yep. <laughs> Something like okay. it. Oh wow. Okay. Okay. So you said George. You said okay. Now you said George Mason. Said George Mason. So George yep. Mason is. It's in Fairfax, Virginia. So Northern Virginia. Okay. And then I shipped out to the University of Oregon and now I came back and I'm here at College Park. So yeah, 3000 miles away. How that that so that's one thing that baffles me, Risa. That's one thing that baffles me. Just seeing what college athletics like just the depths that people are willing to go to. Just so yep. just, just 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 talk a little bit about your process with that from going from here to there. To hear, yeah. just, just talk, please, because I want to understand. I want to understand. So, so it's interesting for me. I never honestly saw myself working at a Power Five institution. So when we think about Power Five schools in the ACC, SEC, Big Ten, Big Twelve, and Pac Twelve, I always saw myself Division Two, II, Division Three, because that's where my internship experience was, along with some mid majors at Division One. Right. So that was what I knew. When I was at George Mason, I think like most folks, we we recognize when we hit a ceiling in, in our positions. And so you start to think about, well, what's next? And if next is not at this institution because there's nowhere to grow, you got to go. And so I started just kind of applying to schools across the country. And I didn't really know if I was willing to make that jump. It took some hard convincing mm -hmm. for me to make that jump. And it's, it's still a running joke for my mother today that, you know, during that time I was um, applying for jobs, none of the mid-major schools would call me back. I was only getting calls from the Power Five institutions. And I think part of that now kind of reflecting on it was 
I had an opportunity to do a lot of work with the NCAA leadership office. And so I think that was able to get my name on the map in ways that maybe it wouldn't have if I wasn't doing that. And so I think within the span of maybe two months, I had physically interviewed at Texas Tech, University of North Carolina, University of Oregon and Tennessee. And so again, all over the map, right? So you talk about like, how did how do you decide these things? And I was fortunate that the University of Oregon wanted me. Um, and I say that because when you look at my resume, it's only the East Coast. And I think sometimes people aren't willing to make that jump and say, we're going to offer you, but we're not sure that you're really going to come. Um, and so my mom and, and my family, we had some conversations. I wasn't quite convinced that I needed to make this jump. And then one of my mentors and I had a conversation and I was fortunate that he was working at George Mason at the time. Also a relation that he was my compliance director when I was a student athlete. So I had known him for a number of years. I trusted him to help me make this decision. And he said, you're single, you don't have any debt. What better time than to Mm. make this jump now? Because you don't, you know, don't have things that have to jump with you. And so I was like, I mean, I guess you're right. This would be a really great opportunity. I don't know what I don't know. And so I literally went from his office to my office and made the call and said, I accept. And probably one of the hardest calls I've ever had to make because I realized I was leaving everything behind. I was going to an unknown space with nobody that I knew in the state or even really on that coast. Um, But again, thankful to this day that he, he pushed me to make that jump because I don't think I would be where I am today if I had not made that leap. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, I love that just just to see that you know you took took the leap on, on faith, and then you know it worked out, and and then then now 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 you're at where you're at back on the other side of back the country. home, literally <laughs> back home. I mean, I grew up in College Park, Maryland, and when I say grew up, like I am two stoplights away from the University of Maryland's campus. Like that's how close mm-hmm. in relation I grew up to this to this campus. And so when I had the opportunity to to come back and interview, I had a friend who was working here at the time. And I said, this just feels too perfect. Like, you know, some situations just Mm. you walk into and you're like, this too perfect. I'm not going to get it. But when she called and offered, my supervisor called and offered, you know, I said, yes, immediately. She was like, "You, you don't need time to think about this. I said, no, I know what you're offering. I know what I'm coming in to do. And I get to come home. Like to me, it felt like a no brainer especially when you're in an industry that doesn't always allow you to be at home to do this job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then one, one thing I was thinking of, as you just said that uh, with your friend that worked uh, at the university of Maryland, as well as with your uh, mentor that, that was, that was with you before just realizing how deep the relationship lines run in athlete. I didn't realize that until yeah. like maybe a few months ago, but it seems like, it, 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 the, I guess the best equivalent I could say is if you go to high school in a certain city and then you go to junior college in that same city, like I feel that the bloodline of athletics is just mm-hmm. that close. Yeah. I mean, I think about it often, like, is it really six de- degrees of separation? Like, do you actually get to that sixth person or is it less? <laughs> because I do think that in a lot of ways we're all connected because many of us are running in the same circles even if we're not necessarily doing the same work. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And as, and as you talk about doing work, as you talk about doing work, I'm going to make a slight pivot and make a slight pivot. So I was on your, I was on your website and I, I saw a blog that, that you wrote mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm just going to pull out a, a little excerpt from the blog. You wrote this blog uh, in, in 2020, in June, 2020. And, and, and the title of the blog was I am black and gay they are not mutually exclusive. Can can you just talk about that? I, I have the excerpt. I'm not gonna read the excerpt yet, but I, I, I want I want to just, just 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 hear from you. Just I want just 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 hear. Yeah, from you. I mean, last summer I think we were all dealing with stuff, and I don't think many of us knew how to deal with it. I think a thing for me is I am a black gay female, right? And I think a lot of times in both communities we try to separate them. It's like you can't be both. And so for me, I just needed to like put that out there. Like, yes, I'm hurt that George Floyd was murdered. I'm hurt that all of my black brothers and sisters are being murdered. But also like recognize that we can still celebrate Pride Month and also understand that there's trauma within the black LGBTQ community, whether it's 
Black folks not wanting us to be a part of it. There's also a number of murders of our trans brothers and sisters, right? And so I was just feeling all of that in that moment when I wrote that. But I think people have to understand that you can hold multiple identities at the same time. And sometimes trauma is added because of those identities that you hold. Mm, yeah, yeah. And 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 then even even in addition to, to, to what you just shared, because what you share is extremely powerful. But I think people who may maybe not uh people who may not have the same identities have no idea what what somebody's trauma looks like or what somebody yeah. else's perspective is or what somebody else's experience is or even how they cope with what's happening around them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, I walk into most spaces with a lot of white people, right? And so I think their at least over the last year, their first inclination is how are you doing because society is not really loving black people right now. Hmm. But I need people to welcome me in as how are you doing? I understand that being black and being gay is really horrific right now. Like I need you to understand that like I am walking every day outside of my door, not knowing if I'm going to come home tonight because of who I am and because of what I look like, right? If I'm driving, an officer may not know that I'm a black female because I have a short haircut, right? I'm out walking the street. I dress very masculine presenting. Somebody may hate me because I am gay, right? So those are all the things that I'm thinking about every time I walk out of my door. And I don't think that people perceive that every day because I walk around with a bubbly character, but there is still things that I have to cope with on a day-to-day -day basis just to walk out of my house. Mm. Wow. Wow. How, how, how do you handle that? Like, how do, how do you, how, how do you uh, allow yourself to, to, uh, to, to be at peace or to be at ease, just knowing that, you know, you're, you're juggling the, these multiple thoughts and, and, and all this on a, on a day in and day out basis, hour by hour, minute by minute. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it's working out. Um, even if you looked at me, you probably be like, what working out do you do? But I do, I work out every day. Um, that's a part of just like my mental health that I need to just like lift a heavy weight or just feel the sweat drip off of me. Right. Um, so for me, that's kind of coping number one. Um, and two is just sometimes writing. Like I, I like to get it out. Uh, my partner and I often have conversations as she's probably more newly out. Um, and so there are some things that I'm talking to her about and she's like, I never thought about it from that lens, right? Because she's not fully um, experienced a lot of things in the LGBTQ atmosphere that I have because she's just recently out, right? And so I think about just the conversations that I have with her. Um, but honestly, it's really in the working out. And, it, and at the end of the day for me, you know, I choose to be out specifically, you know, in terms of LGBTQ community is because I got students that are looking at me and I need these students that are coming behind me to know that you can be whoever you want to be and still get that job. Why? Because you are smart enough to get the job. Yes, you should be able to present how you want to present. Everybody not ready for that. So let me go ahead and have that fight now. So five mm -hmm. years when you're ready to make that step, you're not having that same fight. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Re re ah, representation representation yeah. for sure representation so now now i'm going to read the excerpt from the article because you kind of alluded to it in some of the stuff that you shared but i but i, I just want to i want to read this piece and then i want to know what you were trying what you wanted to convey with this message to the people who would read it yeah. um so the part that really stuck out was, was was these three lines for me being black in america is hard being lgbtq plus in America is hard. Being a woman in America is hard. Yeah, I mean, I think the message I was trying to convey is all of those identities are hard in this country. You know, I think we're still in a place that in certain parts of this country, they're not accepted. I mean, hell, parts of this, this globe are not accepted. Hmm. Um, you know, you walk into spaces and you're immediately denied certain things because of the identities you hold or or the gender that you are. And so I need people to understand like, yeah, like y'all lucky I, I walk out of my house every day. Y'all are lucky I'm still here, right? Like I think about that, not just for me, but the perspective of people who may identi identify in those three categories or even more, right? Like 
if you are not a white man in this country, it is hard as hell to do what you want to do. And I think people need to recognize that this society is still only set up for for what will soon become the minority, but white men, right? And I think people who are white men need to understand that every day that I show up, is a great day for you because I'm I'm hoping to push you to be better to re- especially in athletics to recognize that our students don't look like you and don't identify as you do but you're supposed to be here to help uplift them to get them to that next spot. So in your so in your work with 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 consulting what 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 is what does that look like um and and, and the reason I ask that is because you know, somebody may not realize that that they've been looking through through a biased lens, or yeah. you know, they they might not realize that they've been looking at life through through an entitled lens, if if you will. So, what is what what does consulting with, with you look like, and how how are you really helping people? Yeah, I mean, for me, it, it's always based on what the client needs, right? And so, you know, if a client comes to me and says we want to have a conversation about race. And here are some of the things I I want you to address or talk about with our our organization. I'm always willing to to push it a little bit further. Why are these the three things and what are you missing? And they're always challenged because they don't necessarily know what they're missing because a lot of us aren't doing climate assessments, right? We think, as in leadership or people who are managers, because I don't think it's always the leadership who brings these things to the table, we're not always assessing what the climate is that our our staff or our students are walking into. And so in order for us to truly understand what's happening in our space, we really need to to know from the people. And whether that's through a survey or a focus group, I think that's where we got to kind of tap into. And so somebody may say, these are the three things that I want to talk about, but I'm always going to give you a little bit more to think about that maybe you haven't thought about because I need you to then walk out of this conversation and change things and not just change things to be performative, but change things to actually be better and, and really think about where your policies are to be more inclusive of everyone. Um, I think a lot of times people come to me from a, a race perspective or LGBTQ perspective, but I, I need y'all to know like we need to be talking about religion in, in these spaces. We need to be talking about socioeconomic in these spaces. Again, two areas that I think we try to run away from because Well, we give scholarships, but everybody's not on scholarships. You know, we have students who have various religious identities. Are we thinking about when practices are held versus when some folks may need to go pray, right? It's like, I'm Mm -hmm. willing to push the envelope because those are things that I'm thinking about, you know, just based off of the work that I've done with students and coaches in the past. Mm -hmm. So what what, what exactly is a climate assessment for those of us who might not know? I might be one of the people included. (laughs) Just help help us out. What what, what is a climate assessment? So so simply at its nature, it's assessing what what the culture is in your department. So if you feel and, and climate assessments can look very different depending on what you're trying to understand. So. Um, it could be small as asking questions about around race. So you could have a question on there that says you can show up as your true self every day, right? And some folks may say yes or no, you know, depending on how you have the spectrum. Um, but but again, I think you want to assess, for me, I want you to assess the entire, entire climate, um, mm-hmm. which could take more than 10 minutes, right? And so some people make them smaller and smaller so they can pull certain pieces. Um, And in my experience, it has been helpful that the survey, the assessments that we have done with staff and students bring different results. Because because their experiences are different, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I I wasn't even thinking about assessment until I got to Oregon, which I, which is why I say it was a blessing to go there. Because when I first got there, they had just done their climate assessment. And so I'm walking into, well, here's the bullet of things that we're not really great at. Can, let's, let's start talking about how do we plan education for our students, but also how do we plan education for our staff? And so they're in a spectrum where they're doing climate assessments biannually, for their staff and their students, right? Like to me, that's progressive. That that means that every other year you're trying to understand what does this look like and how do we make sure it's better for everybody? Mm, wow. Do the work. Do 
the work. Okay, so now let's now let's take a slight a, a, a slight a slight pivot, and uh, I, I want to just talk talk with you about um, j- just the aspect of what, what what's happened here. Uh, I, I believe it is more so fairly recent than than not. But about the about the anti-trans bill and, you know, what what this will look like just in regards to affecting, you know, teams and just across the uh, across the lay of the land, if you will. I mean, let's just start with it's really sad that there are people in this country that believe folks will make up excuses so that they can use restrooms of the opposite gender. Right. Like that is a lot of what I'm hearing is, and it's a fear of an unknown, maybe because you have never met a trans identified person, um, that that there is this fear because you're not doing your homework. Um, So for me, watching these bills pop up, I start to wonder what we're doing to educate not only our coaches and administrators, but our students as well. Um, I believe that, you know, there's probably 1%, 2% of our current student athlete population who do identify as trans. And so what are we doing to protect them when we're asking them to still compete for their team, but they're traveling into some of these states that have these very harmful bills? How are we setting our coaches up to understand what this landscape may look like and how do we protect everybody that is, is going into this space? Um, for me, it is, I'm, I feel like I'm always constantly trying to look and see which states are putting legislation on the table, which states aren't signing bills. But also, like, I don't know if you saw more recently, uh, the NCAA made a statement about, you know, we're paying attention to to the bills that are being populated mm-hmm. across the country, um, but that haven't necessarily pulled championships or uh, games out of those states like they did in 2016. In 2016, they pulled six championships out of North Carolina because North Carolina was pulling up a bill about restrooms. And so what was different in 2016, that's, that's not the same today, but we're sending teams to certain states right now to play for championships and we're not having this conversation when the bills seem a lot more hateful than they did in 2016. Oh. Right. So like I'm starting to think about all of those things and how do I start to to navigate that in my own space within, you know, Maryland and thinking about, you know, we travel across the Big Ten country, we call it. And, and it's something that our students are also thinking about. I mean, I've had some students ask me, what, what are the conversations going on? How are we going to navigate this? You know, and I, I think it's very progressive to me to continue to see our students use their voice to ask the questions. Mm, wow. Wow. Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, it's just I think that now is like probably one of the most vocal times uh, that, that I've seen, at least in my life, to where, you know, student athletes, young adults get into the place of where it's like, OK, I want something to happen. And if you're not going to help me, then I'm just going to go out and I'm just going to do it. Yep. So it's just it's, it's, hey, it's, they're different. This. This generation and the generation coming behind them, I, watch out, everybody, because they're not they're not going to sit and take it. And not to say that like our generation sat and took it, but I don't think we were we were prepared to kind of launch the way they are. And, and honestly, mm-hmm. I think as much as we say social media has hurt that generation because they live in that world, I also think it's really helped them because they've been able to connect with people across the landscape and feel like they're not the only ones. And now we're making these connections. And how do, how do I help you go to your legislator and have a conversation? How do I help you have a conversation with your professor who might have said something right? And so they're finding community in ways that have never been done before. This is true. And, and and believe it or not, you can cover, you can do a lot of educating through a, a 60 second TikTok or through a 30 second reel. I, I've, I've been impressed of how some people have mm-hmm. strung together some information. <laughs> yes. I mean, it it's just phenomenal. And, and I want to con- continue to see it happen. Like I just... They're they're just doing things different. They're you know I I had a conversation earlier today um, with a potential client and we were talking about race and you know she was just like it's so interesting once you get out of education how much you realize that the history we're taught in school is not really the history of this country and I said Ooh. welcome my friend welcome Ooh. right and so like 
I think our students are like, yeah, I'm gonna go to this history class because I gotta go because I need to pass and graduate, right? But let me actually go do my real homework. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, so I'm gonna throw a curveball at you, Reese. I'm gonna throw a curveball. Oh boy. Or I'm gonna throw a curve. I'm gonna bowl a curve. You know <laughs> I'm bowl a curve to the to, to the individual who is on a college campus or who's mm-hmm. a young professional and they know these conversations need to be taking place, but yet they don't have buy-in from the higher ups. How, how would you suggest that individual goes about either starting the conversation or just to create more awareness, just, just, just in the space. And, and, and this is an individual who doesn't know, like they don't have all of the information. Yeah. I mean, I think this is where your campus partners come into play, right? Especially if you don't feel like you're an expert in whatever conversation you're trying to have. You know, I think you need to, one, state to your your supervisor that this is something you feel needs to be happening. This education needs to be happening. And it's not for selfish reasons, right? It's because you're looking at the students that are behind you and you're hearing the conversations that they're they're hearing or having, sorry. And so, you know, if your supervisor is supportive of that and maybe they're the only person that's supportive of that, then let's go out to campus and see what conversation campus is having. Because I think it's important for us to remember that we are a part of campus. And so we need to continue to build that bridge both ways. And so how do we start to bring them into a space to start that conversation? And again, I always tell people, sometimes it has to start small. You might have to go one administrator at a time, or you might have to go one coach at a time. I think people forget that coaches have a lot of value at this table. And I think a lot of coaches Mm -hmm. understand and are paying attention to what's happening. So maybe you get three or four coaches on your side. And now let's go have a conversation with your supervisor or a few other folks on leadership team to say, well, you know, this is a conversation we had. It just sparked out of the blue. And, you know, this is something that you need to be aware of. So I believe it's, it's kind of a twofold, but I always like to tell people like, don't be afraid. And if that's not a space you know, that is willing to have the conversation and it starts to be a burden or it starts to wear on you because maybe it does emotionally is is attached to you. Maybe it's not the place you need to be. And that's okay. It's mm-hmm. okay. You know, and I think that goes back to your original, you know, question about, you know, in athletics, people are jumping. And I think we see people jump a little bit more now. And I think it's because people are trying to find spaces that they're fully accepted. And I think that's Mm -hmm. also why we see students jumping. You know, I think, Mm. you know, we see students having these huge signing days and then a year later they may be somewhere else. Right. And so, um, you know, I would love to know this is, and maybe this is research somebody out there can do, but like, why are so many students choosing to transfer these days? Is it, you want to, you just want more playing time or is it because of, you know, what's going on in the society or the community that your campus lives in. So somebody can do that research for us because I'd love to know. Yeah. So I, so I talked with I talked with Ed Jones uh, when we were doing this, this panel for uh, it was like a step up panel. And one thing he was saying just about uh, just in regards to, to that, he said one of the biggest reasons isn't the fact that it's uh, it's like playtime or anything like that. But he said one of the biggest reasons was. You know, when they got signed or when they first got on campus, there's all these touch points, touch points. Hey, how you doing? Da, da, da. But then as time progresses, then you only have one individual who's yep. communicating with you and, you know, checking in on you. And it's no longer 20 people or 30 yeah. people or however many it was. So uh, th- I, I think that's definitely, you know, the case in some instances. But also I can see how that playtime one is, is one, too, because I, yeah. I, I felt some of that. I felt some of that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even like I think about the recruiting processes, I, I because I didn't go through it, I don't know that experience. But it seems like it could, could be so much, right? Like I have a family member who's going through the process now and I'm just like, nope, I'm glad I was not a high valued athlete. Like, no, thank you. Because it just, it seems like so much. And then you do come to college and you're like, okay, whoo, all of that's over. But now like the real work, begins it it sometimes seems like a lot to me um and maybe that's because I don't want all of that on my plate but like you know some people are built for it and then I wonder about those who aren't necessarily built for are we actually giving them the resources to help them 
you know, kind of work through all of those processes. Mm, de definitely, definitely. As, as you as you talk about resources, I want I want to just hear your thoughts, just in regards to uh, as as we as we now have get, getting ready to and prepare to to enter into LGBTQ plus Pride Month, mm -hmm. right? What what would be a resource that you can provide for somebody? It's going to be a two part question. What would be a resource that you can provide for somebody? Well, the first answer I'm gonna answer for him. Of course, it would be it, it would be you know go go ahead and go ahead and go to your website. Yeah. Go, go ahead and book you bring you out and 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 let you let you get some sessions on the books. Um, but but what what resource would you provide for somebody if they're like, well, we we know that uh, Pride Month is coming up. We want to do an event. We don't know how to do an event. Should we do an event like? What, what what would you tell that person? Yeah, all of those questions can be found at my website where you can, uh, you know, sign up for a, for a, for a 30 minute uh, consultant fee with me and we can have a conversation and then you can bring me to your campus. You are absolutely right on that. But I think the second piece is, do you know what the climate of your not only your athletic department, but your campus and community is right? Like, what is the pulse in this space? Because what you don't want to do is one seem performative. I like personally, it bothers me so much that Pride Month has become this performance, not only for, you know, some athletic organizations, not just at the collegiate level. We've seen it at the professional level. Um, you see companies now have rainbow pride flags everywhere incorporated in their clothing and in their uh, businesses. But like, are you donating some of those proceeds to an actual organization that is going to help continue to to fight against some of these bills that are coming, right? Like, so I, I I want us not to be performative. The second piece is most of us need to start with education. We can't truly mm. celebrate what we don't know, and you can't celebrate what you don't know, but you also can't just slap a a figure's face on an article or ask an openly LGBTQ identified person in your organization to be the spokesperson either. Like those are things that personally I don't wanna see. So let's start with mm -hmm. some education. Let's get our language correct. Let's talk about inclusive uh, language policies that should be happening when we're writing articles or you know we're using language within our department. Something simple as putting pronouns or your email address so people know how to address you, right? Like that's something very small that somebody can do. Um, there was another point and it just went out my head because I was thinking about those pronouns. But like those are some of the smaller things that you can do that I just don't think people are taking the time to do. Mm. Wow. Do, do the research. And, and then that also the aspect of the pronouns. Yeah, I mean, again, like, and, and it's something I always say to people when I do presentations on LGBTQ inclusion is like, do y'all go on campus and have meetings? Because when you go into a campus meeting, they start by going around the table. My name is Risa Lovelace. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Mm. Right? So you know how to address someone. And, and it may not seem like a big deal to someone who... Uh, presents as heterosexual, but for somebody who maybe their gender, it, their gender identity is fluid. And maybe today, you know, my pronouns may be he, him, and the, he, him, and his, right? I want to be addressed that way. I don't necessarily want to be addressed as she, her, and hers, because it's not, not the space that I'm in today. And I think people don't understand that gender is very fluid, I think we're starting to see more actresses and singers and actors come out um, and talk about their identity. And I think that's helping the culture all together. Um, but it's not something we talk about in athletics. And athletics is supposed to be a progressive space. Hmm. Yeah, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. So with, 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 with the work that you do and with RBL theory, what is, what is the in-game goal? Like, what 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 are you striving towards to where you be, be able to look back and say, "I did that." <laughs> I did it. I, I, I did that. Yeah, for me, it is the end goal is for all spaces, whether it's athletics, nonprofit, federal government, whatever your industry is, 
that people can walk into the workplace and be be open about who they are, whether it be your LGBTQ identity, whether it be your race, whether it be your religion. Like I want people to be be able to come into those spaces and not feel like they have to hide who they are. I also want people to be celebrated in those spaces, right? Like, you know, Ramadan just happened for our Muslim brothers and sisters. How many of us celebrated that? How many of us checked in on them, you know, through that process? Because it is quite different than, you know, some of us who have other religious backgrounds. And so I think about how are we trying to be super inclusive in this space where it doesn't feel performative, but inclusive enough where people can kind of let their hair down, so to say, uh, when they walk into this space. Walking into my house and walking into my workplace should feel no different. Hmm. That's good. That's good. That's good. So now we're about to we're about to make a we're about to make a pivot. You know, the official word of 2021. We're about to make a pivot. Yeah. And now we're about to uh we're about to go ahead and dive into the two minute drill. And for those of you who might not be familiar, the two minute drill is uh we're we're gonna do some rapid fire questions and just just have a little bit of fun. So Risa, are I'm you I'm a little nervous about this. I told you. Nervous. I told you nothing to be nervous. You already seen the show. There's nothing to be nervous about. You're right. I have. Yeah. Let's see what I got today. Let's see how, yeah. how good my brain is working today. Birdman hand rub. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So are you ready? I am ready. Let's get it. Okay. Here we go. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Okay. Okay. Popeyes or Chick-fil-A? Chick-fil-A. Mm. And I know that doesn't match with my message. But their food is really good. <laughs> <laughs> What's the last book you read? <sighs> Dang, that's a hard question. I should know the answer to this. I'm going to say Becoming because it's sitting on my desk. Mm, that's fair. That's fair. You know, Michelle Obama. Aspirations. Yeah. Solid. No, I mean, no, nothing to question there. Nothing to question there. Most, most underrated cereal. Fruity Pebbles. Mmm. Yep. Yep. Okay. St streaming show of preference. Right now, Who Killed Sarah? Because the second season came out yesterday. Ah. Uh, okay. Okay. I and like then, I like crime shows. At... Do you listen to crime murder mystery podcasts? I do. Th those my, are my partner. My partner doesn't understand because I can go to sleep watching a crime show and she's like, "That doesn't mess with your dreams." Nope. <laughs> Same, same for my partner. That's so funny. That's so funny. And what, what's what's one tip that you want to leave for a student athlete? You can take your time. Mm. Show up in spaces that you want to be present and make a difference, right? I think there's often times that we show up at institutions because there it's cool, it's hip, it's it's the hot ticket. Um, it's going to take us to the next level. But make sure that you're doing all of your homework and your research before you enter these campuses and make sure they're aligned with the values of who you are and where you want to go. Mm. I like that. I like that. And who would you like to see me interview next on Beyond the Ball? I'm going to say, hmm, because I know you've interviewed a few folks I already know. I don't think you've interviewed... Jen Fry yet? I have not got Jen Fry. No, nope, not you. Yet. Need to get Jen Fry. Okay, we need that energy. Yeah, you need that. That's big energy right there. Like, <laughs> like you know, you talk about somebody who is going to tell you how it is, and no filter. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, I love it. Okay, okay. Just say less. Say less. So now, now, Reese, I'm, I'm gonna kick it to you and let let uh, you can let all the people know where they can find you, connect with you, follow you, all that good stuff at this time. All right, so you can follow me on Twitter at RBL Theory09. You can follow me on Instagram at RBL Theory. Uh, I also have a website, rbltheory.com. Uh, you can email me at rbltheory at gmail.com. So I answer all of these things. My phone is always within the arm's reach. 
Um, but again, like I said a couple of weeks ago, we are headed into Pride Month. If you don't have anything on your books, call me. Let's have this conversation and let's be inclusive of our LGBTQ identities and not performative. That's what I got today. Wow. Wow. Risa, thank you for taking the time and, and, and educating us and sharing your heart and even taking us all the way back when you bowled at 279. Man, good days. Good days. <laughs> Oh man, well we we'll definitely stay stay connected and like I said I appreciate your time and you coming out. Appreciate you. To all the ballers out there, to all the ballers out there, you all just heard uh this episode with Risa Lovelace. If you have not connected with her, be sure to connect, be sure to follow. She said on Instagram RBL Theory and then on Twitter RBL Theory 09. Be sure to connect with her, follow her and book her like really i mean we, we can't we can't just talk about making change and wanting change and then not not put some dollars behind it and not invest in in the change of the next generation so uh definitely do all of those things right and then uh shoot her dm let her know what part of the episode really spoke to you what part really stood out and as always you all know this is beyond the ball where we help you succeed beyond your degree What's going on? What's going on? What's going on?